Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about liquid biopsies, specifically the circulating tumor DNA aspect of liquid biopsies. Here are my disclosures. And yesterday I spoke about novel applications of cancer genomics, and I spoke a bit about liquid biopsies there. I'm going to expand on that. I also spoke about immunotherapy, which I will not be speaking about. But the but the underpinnings all really are about the genomics of cancers and how can we utilize these in ways to help patients. And this is just a slide I put up showing all the different tumor types in both children and adult that have been sequenced. And by sequence, I mean all 20,000 genes in their genome. And we have almost 2 million different point mutations and about 20,000 genes. And it poses a very challenging issue. And I showed this slide yesterday that about 91 of these genes have clinical action ability. That either triaging a patient into a clinical trial, giving a prognostic meeting, or identifying a mutation where there's a therapy that will be modified by that mutation or enabled by that mutation. So what we have to do is find alternative uses for these mutations other than predictive and prognostic markers other than immunotherapy. And one of the things I'll be talking about now is using them as dynamic biomarkers in the context of liquid biopsies. As I discussed yesterday, mutations can be identified in the tumor tissue, and that tissue can either be formal and fixed and preserved like it is about 90 percent of the time in most cases, or it can come from frozen tissue. And more recently, we're beginning to look at liquid biopsies, so looking for the equivalent of what we find in the tissue, but from a blood draw. And that can either be from the cellular component of blood, which contains circulating tumor cells, or from the plasma component, which contains these small fragments of DNA in the circulation. And these fragments are released into the circulation. They can either be actively secreted, and we believe those are secreted in exosomes, small packets of uh, small vesicles that are released into the circulation that contain DNA and RNA and even protein from that, those tumor cells. When the cells undergo apoptosis, fragments of DNA can be released. Or when the cells undergo necrosis, larger fragments are released into the peritumoral fluid and then into the circulation. And if you look at this DNA under, uh, under uh, size exclusion methodologies like gel acrophoresis, here you see in the gel under A that if you have necrosis, you have large fragments of DNA, unorganized cell death, these large fragments of DNA are released in the circulation. If you have apoptosis, you have very organized death, and you have very, very predictable sizes in your DNA fragments. And you see here, on the, all the way on the right of that gel, the fragment size of DNA, and the majority is about 180 base pairs. So depending on how the cells are dying, either by necrosis or apoptosis, you can see large differences in the size of the DNA in the circulation. And I showed this yesterday that DNA comes from all cells in the body that are undergoing cellular turnover, primarily from the bone marrow, from the GI tract, from the skin, but also if you're a pregnant female, from the fetus, or transplanted tissue from that transplanted organ. And in cancer, much like <clears throat> a transplanted organ, DNA can be released in the circulation because a tumor is always dividing, always proliferating. So how do we assess for circulating tumor DNA? And there's really two methodologies. There's one called digital PCR, or digital approaches. And there's another approach called with next generation sequencing. And the approaches are quite different. The digital PCR approach can identify mutations that you know you want to look for. So what do I mean by that? For instance, BRAV V600E. I know I want to go in and identify that mutation in certain patients. So I create a digital PCR assay for V600E. And you probe the circulating tumor DNA for that. Digital PCR is quite sensitive, it's quite inexpensive, and it's quite cheap. The problem is, is you can only look for a few mutations at one time. So for instance, you could look at all KRAS, most of EGFR, and all BRAF, but that's about it using digital PCR off of one sample of plasma. So another technology has evolved, and this is using next generation sequencing. And what it does is looks at regions of the genome, sequences across that, and can identify mutations across an entire gene. And this is helpful for looking at mutations in genes like P53, 
or APC where you can have multiple different mutations possible across the entire gene. Or if you want to discover new mutations, this is a way that you can apply a technology to look across multiple mutations. Or let's say you want to look at 60 genes at once. That can only be done using these next generation sequencing approaches. The drawback right now is that this technology is expensive and it takes time and is labor intensive. It takes one to two days uh, at best. Turnaround time clinically is probably going to be in a couple of weeks. So the two major modalities going forward of how to assess circulating tumor DNA. And initially we did digital PCR. And with digital PCR we would take a patient's tumor after it had been resected or a biopsy specimen, sequence that. And in colon cancer, we know the most commonly mutated genes, APC, P53, PI3 kinase, KRAS, NRAS, BRAF. And if you look at all those mutations, in most colon cancers, you're going to find one. Then, then you can probe in the patient's plasma. And this is an example I showed yesterday, but it's very representative. On the left, or on the first histogram there, you see the wild-type fragments, the non-mutated fragments in the green. And in the red, you see the mutated fragments. This is a patient before surgery. After surgery, the levels go down. 42 days after surgery, the levels go up. The CT scan's negative at this point. And then 244 days later, the levels are even higher. So that you can track the mutation in the plasma of these patients, but it was pre-identified using digital PCR in this case. So there's a number of, uh, of interesting things that we can do here. And one of them, like I just showed you, is monitoring response. And what I'm going to show here is not in colon cancer, but in pancreatic cancer, something interesting that we've recently noticed. And we did a, a phase two study, and this is just as a model, of a four-drug regimen in pancreatic cancer. And it's called GTXC, a very low-dose chemotherapy. And we had an astounding uh, response rate of 50% and a disease control rate of about 89%. But, and here is, the, uh, here is a waterfall plot of uh, the radiographic responses. Quite impressive for pancreatic cancer. When we started looking at the circulating tumor DNA levels over time in these patients, what we were seeing was the following. That as you draw blood over time, during the first initial induction therapy, the first dose of therapy, Four days later, we'd measure the circulating tumor DNA level. We started seeing spikes of circulating tumor DNA, and then decrease, and then the low level of circulating tumor DNA, suggesting that maybe what we're capturing with circulating tumor DNA is the killing of the tumor cells, the release and the showering of the circulating tumor DNA into the circulation, and then the resolution, because it has a very short half-life, into a steady state lower level than it was originally. And when we compare this to CA199, what we saw in this patient in the red was a spike, then a decrease. Interestingly, we had given this patient some chemotherapy breaks. And during those breaks and soon thereafter, we saw an increase of the circulating tumor DNA level. We reinitiated therapy, we see a decrease, and then we see an increase again after the patient became resistant. CA199, the protein biomarker here in blue, doesn't show that. So circulating tumor DNA actually is allowing us to see dynamic changes in the tumor over time in a way that is not accurate with CA199. Um, so it may allow us to monitor patients a little bit better than we currently are. Uh, I, I think I had three extra slides and then I apologize. The second application is tracking resistance. So what about other applications of circulating tumor DNA to do things that we couldn't do before other than maybe with serial biopsies. And tracking resistance is one application that I think uh, will have utility, especially in drug development in the future. And we know that the current model is the following. You have a tumor that has a target. With targeted therapy, we treat it. The patient responds, but invariably the patient recurs, especially when we're talking about monotherapy. And when we began to think about this and using circulating tumor DNA a few years ago, at that time we, we thought the colon cancer model with EGFR blockade was a good one to study. We knew that primary resistance to EGFR blockade was dictated by KRAS at that time, mutations in codon 12 and 13. And if you were wild type, you had an enrichment for response, 
But if you're a mutant, you did not respond. What we didn't understand was, what is the molecular resistance evolutionary pattern in these patients who eventually become resistant? When you go KRAS wild type, what happens over time? So we studied this and we looked at KRAS wild type patients with EGFR blockade, and we began to draw plasma serially on these patients as they were treated. And what we saw was the following. We saw that while patients were getting EGFR blockade in this situation with Vectabix, we saw that patients who were KRAS wild type became KRAS mutant. And you can see on the CEA plot there, the patients responded and then became resistant. And as they became resistant, you saw the emergence of KRAS mutations. Now, we were looking at this using digital PCR, and we looked at multiple different mutations across KRAS and other genes. And what was interesting was we just didn't see one mutation. In many cases, we saw two, three, or four mutations in the same tube from the same patient suggesting that there were multiple routes of escape, either in different metastases in that patient, or in different regions, or maybe even different cells within the same tumor from these patients. We then inter interrogated NRAS alongside KRAS, BRAF, and PI3 kinase, as well as the exomet domain of EGFR. And what we saw was something very similar. Patients who were wild type in KRAS, wild type in NRAS, wild type in BRAF, wild type for EGFR and PI3 kinase mutations began to show the development of not only KRAS mutations, but NRAS mutations and EGFR mutations. And these mutations would occur multiple times in the same sample, suggesting again that we're setting up a situation where there are multiple ways for these tumors to escape this inhibition by EGFR blockade. And it also taught us something else. It taught us something about the pathway. This is the EGFR pathway. And we know it really breaks into two parts, the RAS pathway and the PI3 kinase P10 AKT pathway. What we saw was that the majority of mutations, or virtually all of them, were present in the KRAS pathway all the way down to NRAS, and none were present in the PI3 kinase pathway, P10, or AKT pathway. So suggesting that we've really delineated a pathway and its resistance mechanisms going forward. Um, I know there's been a lot of literature suggesting that PI3 kinase or P10 or even AKT may modulate uh, EGFR blockade, but from the data so far from acquired resistance, it appears that its major efficacy is down the RAS pathway. So the insight from this looking at resistance patterns by tracking circulating tumor DNA was that not only could we define the molecular basis of secondary resistance to EGFR blockade, what we saw was heterogeneity in how resistance developed. And the other thing from a feasibility standpoint, from a drug development standpoint, was that these patients on average had multiple, had 10 different, different uh, metastases in their body. To do the seven blood draws that we did over time, and these individual patients would have been over 1,100 different biopsies, which is not clinically feasible. So the blood draw allowed us to pool what's happening in the entire met metastatic profile of that patient in a single blood draw and see the heterogeneity evolve. One of the, I think, scary things for drug development and for targeted therapy um, is that this paints a, a very challenging picture. It takes us from a patient who is wild type in all these genes, we apply a targeted therapy, and then they become resistant in a heterogeneous fashion. I know how to treat the wild type patient. I don't know how to treat the patient who's MET amplified, KRAS mutated, BRAF mutated, and NRAS mutated all at the same time. It's much more challenging. So we have to come up with new paradigms on how to at attack this heterogeneity that will evolve over time. I'm running out of time, but I do want to go through some other aspects that I think are important. And one is molecular remission. And the approach here is to take the tumor in a patient who might be cured from surgery, sequence the tumor, and then post-operatively look at the plasma to see if, are there any residual fragments of DNA in the circulation left or not. And this was the first hint that we could maybe do this in this first patient.
after surgery, you resect the tumor, and then the plasma, one day after or six weeks after, you assess for circulating tumor DNA. So it's very specific to the original tumor. And when we do this initially with CEA, measured six to eight weeks after a potentially curative resection for colon cancer, if it's detectable, they all recur, and if it's undetectable, some recur. This is statistically significant, but not clinically meaningful. If you're a patient in either one of these curves, you're not going to be very satisfied. But when we looked at circulating tumor DNA, six to eight weeks after surgery, those with detectable levels all recurred, and those with undetectable levels did not recur in this initial pilot study. So in order to, to evaluate this further, we collaborated with Gene T and Peter Gibbs in Australia, and we've initiated a, a clinical trial in stage two colorectal cancer patients, where we're looking at 250 patients who are undergoing curative resection, taking the tumor, sequencing it for the known mutations, and then probing postoperatively six to uh, four to ten weeks after surgery for the presence of circulating tumor DNA. And we're about halfway analyzed at this point, and the Kaplan-Meier curve looks very similar to what we saw in our initial pilot study. Those patients without circulating tumor DNA after surgery largely do not recur, whereas the ones with circulating tumor DNA present after surgery are recurring there in the red. Just want to go on to one final section, and it's early detection. Using the same approach, we looked at a variety of different tumor types with early stage disease. And what I can show you here is, is that in colon cancer, when you look at stage one, two, and three colon cancers, all the way on the left, we can detect about 75% of colon cancers with a simple blood draw. The same is true for gastroesophageal cancers, where it's about 60%. It's about 45% for pancreatic cancers and 50% for breast cancers. So opening up the possibility of detecting circulating tumor or early, or cancer early using circulating tumor DNA. And this is across 14 different tumor types, and you can see in stage one tumors, all the way in the left, you can detect about 40% of them. I'll leave you with this last piece of data. There is a lot of work going on in the fetal DNA wor world using cell-free DNA to detect aneuploidies in the fetuses. Hundreds of thousands of women have gone through these studies now. Not just studies, but it's clinically available. What they're starting to find, and what I've been called about occasionally, is we're seeing these weird patterns of aneuploidy in these patients. And these patterns weren't aneuploidy in the fetus. These patterns were aneuploidy, or changes in the DNA in the mother. And what was found unknown to the mother, and unknown to the doctor, and unknown to the company at the time, that these young women who were pregnant weren't just pregnant, they also had cancer. So it kind of is a proof of principle for us in an unsuspected, unsymptomatic population of women who are pregnant, who are getting a test of cell-free DNA for fetal aneuploidy, and they're discovering cancer. And so this is a data from Sequinome, where they found a number of cancers, including colon cancer. But it offers us, at least, some, some hope that circulating tumor DNA will be useful in the future for early detection. So in summary, somatic mutations could be biomarkers largely because of specificity, and I went through some of that yesterday. The new technology, digital genomics with next generation sequencing, is really going to open up the door. And future applications will be genotyping, monitoring, track and resistance, minimal residual disease, and early detection. And finally, my last point is that this will all become even more feasible as the cost of sequencing goes down. We'll not only be able to look at point mutations, but we'll be able to look at many genes. We'll then look at structural changes and eventually the whole genome and whole, whole exome and whole genome over time. I want to thank the Ludwig Center for Cancer Genetics, where a lot of this work was done, and my mentors and colleagues and supporters with Swim Across America and Ludwig Center. Thank you, and sorry for going over. <laughs>